Okay, we're going to get started. This is Michael Morris, a Senior Strategic Advisor with the National Disability Institute. I am pleased that so many of you have taken the time today to join us. This is an unprecedented level of cooperation among over 18 national disability organizations. Uh, most of those organizations you're going to hear from today also want to thank Senator Casey's office for being with us and also several of our federal leaders uh, to give a very short um, statements on uh, what is going on from their different federal agencies that they represent. First, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to turn to Katie with just some quick logistical information about your listening to this webinar. Katie? Michael, uh, the audio for today's meeting can be accessed using either your computer audio or by calling in by phone. If you select computer audio, please make sure that your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or if you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial 1-929-205-6050. And enter the meeting code 870-458-878. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found by clicking on the CC button in your Zoom controls at the bottom of the screen. If you do not see the captions after clicking the button, please alert the host and DI webinars via the chat box. You may also view captions in your browser at http colon slash slash www.streamtext.net slash player question mark event equals NDI. Please use the chat box to submit any comments that you have during the webinar and we will direct them accordingly. There will be a survey sent out at the end of the listening sessions for you to share your additional comments. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and send a message to the NDI host or email hope at hprice at ndi-inc.org. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the National Disability Institute website at nationaldisabilityinstitute.org slash resources slash webinars. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and again, thank all of you for joining us. We had over 750 people participate yesterday and uh, the number is quickly approaching 600 and I expect we'll get uh, up to somewhere between 750 and 1,000 individuals who have signed up for this discussion and listening session today. Uh, we will first hear from the Office of U.S. Senator Bob Casey on legislation that is both approved and pending before Congress to respond to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic particularly as it impacts people with disabilities, their families, and service provider agencies. Before we hear with a very limited time of five minutes from the many disability organizations and the disability community participating today, we have several guests from federal agencies who are leaders for us in helping um, support service delivery, um, protections and advocacy on behalf of people with disabilities. Uh, we will share with you some important resources. We will ask you to take a survey and talk with you a little bit about next steps. Uh, you will see later in the presentation of slides a quick summary that we did on important lessons learned from yesterday's listening session, which we will add to uh, after today and be available to you. So with that, if we can go to the next slide. So first, um, I want us to turn to Thomas Egan, who is a Health and Aging Fellow 
with Senator Bob Casey's office. Thomas, can you give us a, a quick uh, sort of snapshot of what's going on on Capitol Hill? You'll need to unmute yourself. I know Thomas is there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, it says I'm muted. You're, you're good, we hear oh, you. I'm good, okay, okay, great. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank um, Michael and NDI and really all of the folks who have come together to um, put this webinar together and um, really talk about the issues facing the disability community uh, as this coronavirus uh, spreads across the country. And really the, the work that is being done on Capitol Hill right now um, really represents a number of offices, not just um, Senator Casey, but also um, Senator Patty Murray has been working very, very diligently um, through her position on the health committee, as well as Representative Dingell. Um, and these issues have spanned from providing nutrition services, home delivered meals, to community-based, uh, home and community-based services and supports, to the availability of uh, personal protective equipment and testing capabilities um, around the country. We have, are, we are in the process of reviewing uh, the text from the third supplemental package coming out of Congress. Um, we expect that this will be just shy of $2 trillion. Um, it addresses uh, healthcare concerns directly, um, small businesses, um, putting dollars in the pockets of families. And um, there are a couple of disability specific provisions that we were happy to see uh, that I'll go into in a second. Um, but there are also a number that were left off that we will need to continue to fight for and have you all advocate for as we continue to move through this package. Uh, just quickly, uh, the going over the other two. So this is the third. The first one was more emergency relief for and response for the states, and that was at eight billion dollars. The second package really addressed um, workers and family paid sick leave, and that was around $1 billion. So we've really expanded kind of um, above and beyond. So within the third COVID package, supplemental package, uh, and you may have seen some of this coming out this morning, uh, they have approved small uh, nonprofits will be eligible for the small business payroll loans. They've expanded uh, unemployment benefits to increase by $600 per week. They've also extended the amount of time that somebody is eligible for unemployment benefits by 13 weeks. Uh, the coverage was also expanded to those who are self-employed, part-time workers, as well as those working in the gig economy. Uh, there was a spousal impoverishment uh, protection that Senator Casey championed was extended as well as money follows the person. Um, we have also seen an increase in mental health services, um, new programs to provide direct aid to healthcare institutions and changes to or increases to the supplemental uh, nutrition assistance program or SNAP. Uh, we were also very happy to see about $85 million extended to uh, Centers for Independent Living, um, as well as uh, $15 million for federally funded housing, uh, specifically for people with disabilities. Um, and then if you want to click to the next slide. Great. So, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that you were on. There we go. Um, so this is a number, uh, these bills you can see, again, kind of across um, Congress, a number of offices have been working on these issues. And while we didn't see um, 
a lot of the provisions specifically from uh, these bills put into this third package. What these bills do is they lay what we call the legislative groundwork. So the language is put in um, the correct format, put into place and introduced. And then as we move forward into uh, the subsequent packages of relief funding, we hope to be able to pull some of the language uh, from these bills and drop them in to specifically address uh, the needs of the disability community as a whole. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there and pass it back over to Michael. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, again, more details are going to come out uh, later today and tomorrow. And uh, we'll work closely with you to provide this information through all the organizations participating uh, today uh, directly out to uh, people across the country. Let me go next to um, several key federal leaders who have graciously taken their time to be with us today. Let me go first to Mark Schultz, who is the RSA Commissioner and uh, also over the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, sometimes known as OSERS. Mark, are you there? I am. Thank you, Michael. So first, I just want to thank you and NDI for creating this opportunity and for the partnering organizations and their willingness to share what they're hearing on the ground with us uh, during the listening session today. So thank you all. Um, the opportunity to hear from you will help us be better informed and particularly with OSERS so that your voice is being heard and that's going to improve the quality of our services and supports. So we understand the importance and urgency of providing this information and guidance to individuals with disabilities, their families, educators, service providers, and all our partners in early childhood um, education and employment. So as we address these issues and questions that have arisen due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we did issue a Q&A document uh, on the special education side on March 12th that tried to address some issues and followed that with supplemental fact sheet that was issued just last Saturday in which we were able to clarify some additional issues. And so particularly clearly setting out the secretary's expectation that all students, including students with disabilities, can see, continue receiving educational services during this time. Also, we made it clear that schools must provide a free and appropriate public education to students with disabilities and that the provision of FAPE may include, as appropriate, special education and related services that could be provided via computer or internet or phone or other remote um, uh, technologies. In addition, we know that in some cases those technologies might not be accessible or materials might not be read readily available in an in accessible format. Um, so what we do is encourage that schools must need to provide equally effective online access to that curriculum or services uh, provided to other students. So that has to happen and I think we've made that clear in the supplemental fact sheet that was sent out. In support of that, we have also established single points of contact for early childhood Part C programs as well as a single point of contact for a Part B program. So for Part C, that contact is the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center, and that's at ectacenter.org. And for Part B, the single point of contact is the National Center for Systemic Improvement at ncsi.wested, that's w-e-s-t-e-d, dot org. That's where we want you to start. So they are connecting all the resources that are available around distance education, distance learning, and alternative strategies um, and best practices and models that states are using to reach out and provide services to students with disabilities at this time. So we encourage you to, to work with those CA centers and to identify things that might be able to be used in your state. So we continue to also get questions on the BR side. We're fielding questions actually on both sides. And so in response to that, we are working on establishing a TA center or a single point of uh, contact on the BR side as well. And we will be pro providing more information about that um, very soon. 
So additional information as we update this can be found at ed.gov. And that's the website to go to. And if you go to that website, there's a tab for coronavirus information. And if you go to that, any of the major guidance that's developed across all the programs in the Department of Education will be posted there. And that will include the supplemental fact sheet and our previous questions and the answers document in regards to services and uh, for students with disabilities. So I encourage you to go there to keep up to date. More is changing. Um, we continue to develop additional guidance and, and that's why this listening session is so important because you have the opportunity to help us understand what your priorities are, what those needs are, and hopefully we can better address that within the guidance that we produce. So thank you again, Michael, for this opportunity and I look forward to hearing um, from our partners. Thank you, Mark. Let's turn next to, next slide, please, is Julie Hocker, Commissioner in the Administration on Disabilities at the Administration for Community Living. Julie, have you been able to join us? Did we get Julie on? We're having some technical difficulties with Julie, so I'll All try right, to get her on shortly. Okay, let's move on because we're so tight for time. Let's go to the next slide. And Jennifer Sheehy, Deputy Assistant Secretary, U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Disability Employment Policy. Jennifer, have you been able to join? Yes, I have. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for this, uh, this incredible opportunity to hear about what the organizations are experiencing at the local level. Within the Department of Labor, all of our agencies are working together to ensure that workers, including those with disabilities and the employers that employ them are aware of and able to respond to the COVID-19 issues. I want to refer people to two websites um, that contain a multitude of resources today. I'll put them in the chat box after I stop talking, but the first is dol.gov and the second is askjan.org, A-S-K-J-A-N.org, easy, easy websites with a lot of resources. First, um, the Job Accommodation Network is one of our funded resources that provides one-on-one -on -one consultations on accommodations. They have put out a guidance for employers and employees on how to uh, how to set up telework sites and using accommodations that might be available to both um, the employers and employees. They also have guidance on how to deal with communicable diseases such as COVID-19 in the workplace um, and what the employer responsibilities and the employee's rights are when managing the, uh, the work and how to deal with these uh, diseases during this pandemic. If people go to askjan.org, they can email their questions. They can also call at 800-526-7234. Uh, and uh, there's a TTY number as well, 877-781-9403. There are also situations and solutions on the JAN website, which are real life scenarios based on inquiries received by JAN already from employers and workers with disabilities to help guide them on providing accommodations. The second uh, resource I wanna tell you about is an online dialogue that is running right now. It's an online listening session so that we can hear from the public. And it's very important that uh, people with disabilities and organizations that represent them comment on this online dialogue. It is inviting stakeholders to comment on the paid family and medical leave and paid sick leave that is now new under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. So there are new resources for paid sick time uh, that are more flexible and generous under this act 
but uh, it goes into effect on April 1st. The, the dialogue runs until March 29th, so I would encourage people to uh, go to dol.gov and you will learn how to participate in that online dialogue. The third resource is the unemployment insurance benefits that the Department of Labor um, is making available to employers and em to employees that are affected by um, job closings, uh, biz small business uh, closures, and some of the new flexibilities. If an individual needs to leave employment due to a risk of exposure or infection or even to care for a family member, uh, the, the benefits may be, they may be eligible for these benefits if their state chooses to exercise that flexibility. I'm going to stop there because I know you've got a, a lot of wonderful speakers and we are listening too because we want to pro continue to provide resources and also help em employees and workers with disabilities when they are getting back to work following this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, again, those resources will come up in the chat box. Were we able to work out technical difficulties with Julie Hocker? Yes. Great. Julie, yes. I'm so glad I'm here. you're there. Yes. Uh, can you give us a few minutes of your time and, and share things you're doing uh, through uh, Administration for Community Living? Absolutely, but I also have to first uh, say uh, it's always hard to follow my good friends, Mark and Jennifer, and it's great to hear um, all of our partners across federal government uh, just uh, working on all of these critical issues. So it's my pleasure to join them in the conversation and in um, helping um, individuals with disabilities all across our nation. And Michael, I just want to thank you and everyone um, at NDI and everyone on the call. Um, you all have been fabulous, uh, not just with uh, our COVID-19 response, but across many issues facing Americans with disabilities. So I wanted to say thank you for bringing us all together today and, and always on, on important issues. I have a couple of quick updates, but before um, I go any further, I wanna make sure that we also give out our website. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. acl.gov slash COVID-19. Um, that website is updated around the clock. I literally mean that. Sometimes we get stuff up at two in the morning. Um, and it is um, as many resources as we can possibly get up there for both our network and grantees, but also American, uh, Americans with disabilities and their families. Um, and we are working all of the time to add to those resources. So we encourage people to visit there frequently. And of course, um, our good colleagues at the CDC continue to manage uh, the overall response and information for the public and we always encourage you to visit the CDC's page throughout the day as well. Um, as you can imagine at HHS, uh, we have been quite busy for several weeks. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of insights into specifically the work that we're doing at ACL um, and also tell you where we can use your help because um, as we're working with our colleagues across the CDC, CMS, the Office of Civil Rights, um, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Response, and many of our other friends, um, they also need to continue to hear about the issues and opportunities we have during this response. So as you can imagine, ACL is embedded at every level of this response um, across the HHS, and we've been at the table for a number of weeks now, and we're really focused in on ensuring that our responses um, uh, across the nation that they really focus on, and I think uh, you'll you'll hear this from many leaders in the administration, they're locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. And so our job at ACL, one of our critical jobs is to make sure that our federal programs um, are, uh, are continue to be federally supported. So I encourage anyone on the line who needs support from a number of our programs, from independent living to our university centers of excellence, um, to our protection and advocacy organization, know that our federal staff is up and working um, and, and just as responsive as always. 
Um, next, we are working on a couple of critical issues, um, including working to ensure that direct service providers are classified as healthcare um, workers in, in our nation's workforce. We know that that's really important um, because of the critical role that they play in helping uh, people with disabilities every day be able to stay safely at home and living in their communities. We continue to work with our friends across HHS on that issue. We know that ensuring access to response and facilities um, has, uh, is always a challenge, particularly in times of crisis and disaster. We're working with the CDC and with FEMA to make sure that um, as states and, and local authorities work quickly to respond to the needs in their communities, that they're ensuring equal access to those cares, to that care and those facilities by giving them information. And I would just remind you guys here um, that we will try to continue to get up uh, as much assistance as we can on our website, but we also know that there's a deployed resource uh, of our network all in, in our communities and states. And so um, please also know that your protection and advocacy organizations are up and running. I'm in consistent contact, met with all of the CDC CEOs earlier this week on those issues. So we will continue to work with that. The other place where we're really looped in, and I'm talking to the director multiple times a day, is with our Office on Civil Rights. One issue that we uh, greatly care about, that we are keeping very close tabs on, is ensuring that no one is denied access to care based solely on their disability. Uh, this, this might be a little bit of a, a, a hard one for, for some folks because a lot of disabilities also uh, have those underlying medical conditions. I, I, uh, I speak from personal experience and know how, how difficult that one is, but um, we are working really hard to ensure that everybody understands uh, that we cannot be discriminating based on disability. And I wanna stop here and um, remind folks, if you have any cases or incidences where someone's civil rights uh, are being denied as they seek medical care during uh, this crisis, we urge you to go to HHS's website, um, which is hhs.gov backslash OCR. And on there is updated guidance and information. Um, it's updated in a timely way, but also there's a way to quickly report any incidences and open a case. Uh, with OCR and they've asked me to continue to broadcast that because we want to know um, where there are cases um, of people being denied care or otherwise uh, not having equal access to care based solely on their disability. Another issue that we have heard about and we are working not only within the federal government um, and with CDC and with FEMA on, but really with our broad network is ensuring that information is equally accessible and in multiple formats. So as you see uh, those formats, um, if, if, you, if we haven't seen them, you should feel free to send them into us. Um, we'll try to help them get disseminated, but we're really working closely with the CDC to increase um, the level of access on the communication front. And then finally, I just want to note that one of our key jobs is to make sure that our network of Centers for Independent Living, PNAs, USEDs, um, DG councils, all of our great many folks in our network have the resources that they need to be out there working the front lines. So please know that our Centers for Independent Living are um, still operating and functioning. All of our PNAs, our USEDs, um, the staff may be dispersed in teleworking, but they have the full support of the federal government behind them, and they're really there as boots on the ground to help Americans with disabilities um, all across the country continue to uh, remain safely in their community or have the help they need as they seek care and return back home. So um, the last thing I want to say is the best way to reach us if you have any questions or need help or want to provide input, if it's specific to um, our programs and area, I would just encourage you, you can email us at aod at ACL dot hhs dot gov and that inbox is monitored all day long by our staff and we'll make sure to get back to you in a timely fashion and i'm looking forward to staying on the call and being in listening mode uh just so that we can continue to be informed and best serve the community thank you thank you so much julie and thank you uh mark jennifer and julie for the work you're doing inside government uh to make sure that people with disabilities interests and needs are heard and uh, addressed. Let's go to our partnering organizations. And next slide, please. Um, 
I do not know, did Karen, are you able to be with us again today from Access Living in Chicago? I don't believe she is. I don't so. Let's go to the next uh, group then. We're going to go to Maria Town, President and CEO of AAPD. Maria. Hi, Michael, and uh, thanks to you and the team at NDI for organizing these webinars. And thank you to all of our uh, federal leaders, both the congressional staff who were on earlier and Julie and Mark, um, as well as to all of the community advocates who are on this webinar today. The disability community has done some incredible advocacy over the past uh, weeks over the past 24 hours um, to make sure that our priorities are included in COVID relief packages. And um, just in the past day, quite a bit has changed um, as we've heard earlier. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the positive things we, we are seeing and expecting in this third COVID relief package and some things that we will need to continue to advocate for. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the current language for the third COVID relief package does provide significant additional funding um, for programs that focus on older adults, older Americans. Uh, <clears throat> it makes sure that older adults can maintain access to food um, and, and receive support. That is fantastic. Um, but as AAPD, a, a cross-disability civil rights organization, um, I want to make sure that everyone realizes uh, not all people with disabilities are seniors. While the, um, a huge part of the disability community in the United States is older than 65, many of us, including myself, including many of the speakers on this call, um, are, are not seniors and will not qualify for these additional funds and for these um, supplemented programs. And we need to make sure that when we're thinking about home and community-based services and additional supports to make sure that people with disabilities can remain in the community during this crisis, um, that those supports are available to people who are middle-aged with disabilities and young professionals and, and young people with disabilities, uh, because we certainly don't want the rate of uh, teenagers with disabilities in nursing homes to rise, which is already a huge concern um, in our community. Um, the, the other thing that I um, am excited to see is that this package does make sure that any um, rebates, uh, recovery rebates received by people with disabilities will not count as an asset against a means test for a program like SSI or Medicaid. And so it's making sure that the recovery is equitable um, across all Americans. One of the um, groups that's continually missed, though, are parents and family members who may have to step into a caregiving role because their family member's caregiver is either sick or having to care for their own family. Um, and if they are not in a position where they can take off um, time for work due to the crisis, they are really strapped um, if they have no, no paid leave for themselves. And so we need to make sure that these particular care workers, um, informal care workers, are able to have access to support for themselves and their families and not be penalized for trying to keep their family safe and healthy. And that's, that's all I have, have for today. Fantastic. To we got to keep moving. Maria, yeah. wonderful as always with your insights and, and suggestions. Let me go next to the American Network of Community Options and Resources, Anchor. And Donna, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Michael. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am the Director for State Partnerships and Special Projects at Anchor. And for those of you who might not know us, we are a national nonprofit trade association that's representing more than 1,600 private providers of long-term supports and services for people with IDD. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to take a few minutes to brief you on the three key areas of support our provider members need in order to support the health and well-being of the people they, they work with. Um, and to also share what we are doing in response. 
in all, we are hearing that providers need resources and supplies, flexibility, and direct labor, uh, actual staffing. So to start with resources and supplies, obviously our members need funding as they are almost exclusively relying on Medicaid funds. This was true well before this crisis, um, but this need is dramatically heightened at this time. We're also hearing that like so many in, <clears throat> excuse me, direct care settings, there's um, a huge short shortage of PPEs. In some ways, there's an overall shortage, so no amount of money will help, but where limited supplies are available, providers need funding to purchase those supplies. By ensuring that our staff can support and protect people at home, they are less likely to enter the acute health the acute healthcare system, which is already buckling under the weight of this unprecedented need. Related to supplies, access can be a challenge. Access to groceries, medication, other essential supplies can be challenging because many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities rely on their direct support staff to help them with access. And as staff are compromised, so is their access. A few things we're doing in response to this need. As always, we're lobbying Congress for people with disabilities to be prioritized and for emergency HCBS funding to be allocated in the relief packages um, that have been debated and that are yet to come. To date, we have mobilized 26,000 advocates and have sent over 60,000 messages to members of Congress. We're also encouraging states to issue guidance, clarification, and additional funding for emergency waivers. And we've written to CMS urging that they approve the state's requests for flexibility and emergency funds through the emergency waiver process. Of course, we're also trying to be creative and think outside the box. For example, last week we sent a letter to the Amazon CEO, Jeff Bezos, asking that people with disabilities be prioritized as his company needs to discern between essential and non-essential deliveries. With regard to flexibility, we're hearing from our members that flexibility from federal and state governments is crucial, whether it be for encouraging the use of telemedicine in place of regular healthcare visits, defining direct support professionals as essential workers, as Julie mentioned, um, and, other, uh, and other such flexibilities. As I mentioned, we sent a letter to CMS two weeks ago seeking additional guidance on this, and we're tracking and sharing where states issue such guidance and flexibility. That information is available on our website, and I will post to those links in the chat section um, shortly after this. We've also contacted the National Governors Association, urging its members to explicitly define direct support professionals as essential workers, so that their ability to get where they need to go to support the people that are relying on them continues without hindrance. And finally, with regard to labor and staffing, as many of you know, our workforce was in crisis long before the COVID-19 pandemic, and the shortage of workers is being exacerbated by the fact that direct support staff are contracting the virus, staying home to care for children or others as schools and businesses are closed. And with, in response, we've launched, launched two distinct campaigns to try to mitigate this issue. The first is hashtag DSPs, are essential. This offers a series of actions and tools that show the essential nature of the direct support workforce in an effort to ensure that as many existing DSPs as possible are able to continue to do the work um, in their community that people are relying on. Um, and the second campaign is designed to support providers to recruit new DSPs, specifically from the pool of displaced workers who have been laid off from restaurants, hotels, airlines, and more. These campaign tools include a video about the nature um, or the value of a career as a DSP, a place where employed, unemployed workers can figure out how to find direct support jobs in their community, and guidance for providers to expedite training and onboarding. All of these tools can be accessed at anchor.org slash DSP careers. So all of the materials that Anchor is developing, we are making free to access regardless of membership or not. So I hope you find the tools useful and I'll add the URLs and my contact e email to the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, let's go next to APSI, the Association of People Supporting 
uh, uh, Employment First. Um, and Julie, are you with us? I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So, hi, everyone. I'm Julie Christensen. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Association of People Supporting Employment First, or APSI. We're a national member-based organization dedicated to the goal of improving employment outcomes for people with disabilities. And our members include supported workers, supported employment professionals, including job coaches and job developers, state workforce, vocational rehabilitation, and Medicaid representatives um, within states, as well as other stakeholders who are committed to promoting the principles of employment first. Um, as an organization, we share many of the same concerns as our partners on this call, uh, and we're grateful to NDI for this opportunity to be part of the conversation. We are specifically working in collaboration and coalition to assure that emergency efforts are responsive to the needs of people with disabilities with um, a particular emphasis on employment. So of critical concern to us is ensuring that supported employment and other employment services remain operational and available in states. We're hearing from our members that employment services are becoming harder and harder to access. Um, from our provider members, we're aware of downsizing in the direct support workforce, which includes job coaches and job developers. Um, and one example is a provider who laid off 65% of their staff this past week. We're also aware that large numbers of supported workers are facing furloughs. One provider shared with us that 60% of individuals they support had been laid off as of Friday of last week. And so to that end, APSI is placing special emphasis on a couple of areas, ensuring that people with disabilities who can work have the support they need to remain successful in the workforce, um, to keep their jobs and to remain safe and healthy during this time. We're also monitoring emerging needs in the workforce with an eye on continuing to promote inclusive hiring practices where those opportunities are available, particularly in essential businesses um, like grocery stores, retail distribution centers, hospitals and health centers, et cetera, who are actively hiring to fill open positions. And all of this means providing training to employment specialists on new ways of doing business, including strategies like job coaching by telephone, webinar, and other platforms. Um, in order to do all of this, we have to advocate hard with federal and state governments to ensure flexibility in billing options for providers so we keep dollars flowing and we keep um, service providers in business. We're specifically working with partners in the disability community on three particular asks of Congress. Um, one that it does look like is in this um, package three um, stimulus bill. Um, being that provider agencies, many of whom are not-for-profit agencies that, who receive Medicaid funds, it does look like they will be able to access small business loans. That's huge for our members. Um, however, not in um, the current stimulus package that we're aware of is the need for increased Medicaid funding and home and community-based grants to ensure that services for people with disabilities, including employment supports, remain operational, as well as income relief that, that includes people with disabilities um, uh, without any detrimental impact on other benefits, including health care. Um, we are also engaged in state advocacy with an emphasis on getting direct support professionals, um, including job coaches and job developers, to be classified as essential workers, and also exploring flexibility in service delivery for employment and related supports that are funded by Medicaid LPSS and vocational rehabilitation. Um, so APSI is here to be a resource on all things disability employment. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach us at info at APSI.org. Um, and you can also reach me directly at Juliet APSI.org. And I will put those in the chat box as well. Thank you so much, Julie. Let's go next to the Autism Society of America. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, no, there we go. Uh, Chris Banks, are you with us? Is Chris with us today? All right, let's keep, keep, keep moving. Let's go, next slide. Um, let's go to the Baselin Center for Mental Health Law and Jennifer Mathis. Jennifer? There we go. Yes, can you hear okay. me? Yes, we can. And just to, for you. a moment, uh, Denise, you're in the standby. We'll be calling on you next. So go ahead, Je uh, Jennifer. Sure. So 
Hi, I'm the Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. The Bazelon Center is a national nonprofit that does both um, litigation and policy advocacy around the country on behalf of people with um, mental disabilities, primarily psychiatric disabilities. Um, and our top concerns, I think, are um, similar to uh, those uh, that some others have articulated, um, particularly a focus on supporting home and community-based services. Uh, the community is where most people with psychiatric disabilities are and live, um, but it is already dramatically underfunded, under-resourced, and now um, in many places, the community service systems really seem uh, at serious risk of collapsing because of um, the restrictions that are placed on folks um, in many places due to the pandemic. And um, certainly what we have seen in the cases that we are doing is that uh, people are stuck in institutions that transitions out of institutions have effectively come to a halt um, in many places. Community providers don't have telehealth capacities available. And there's you know variation among states about how much uh, Medicaid has uh, already covered uh, telehealth services and who can provide telehealth services. Um, and you know, in some cases, it it can be, but doesn't have to be provided. Um, but certainly, we have seen community providers say we we can't support any new folks coming out of institutions, whether they be um, psychiatric hospitals or nursing homes, etc. And so, um, people are stuck. Um, the institutions that they are in have become, in many cases. Uh, more prison-like, more restrictive because of the uh, concerns about the pandemic. People can't go out um, when they otherwise would have been able to in many cases. Um, and frankly, you know, uh, now people are at risk of, uh, you know, heightened risk of actually being vulnerable to the pandemic because of being confined in a um, crowded environment where you really can't do social distancing. And so um, we have very serious concerns, I think, on the front end and on the back end of institutionalization that the community service system really needs to be supported um, in ensuring that people uh, don't go in um, and uh, ensuring that people can come out. And um, right now that is a serious issue. And I also just want to point out that in mental health, I think, you know, many people talk about HCBS and um, they've been trying to monitor the language that's used in the bills because HCBS often doesn't cover community mental health services. Most community mental health services are not provided through HCBS funding streams or, or funding streams labeled HCBS. Um, they are provided through the Medicaid rehabilitation option. And so um, there are community mental health services provided other ways and, you know, one funding stream in particular that is labeled HCBS, but most of them are not. And so it really matters kind of how the HCBS is described in these bills and that it includes community mental health services. Um, and uh, it's interesting that I think at this point in time, you have uh, some decarceration efforts from jails um, in this country, as well as you know, other places around the world. Um, I think there has not yet been a similar focus on um, can we do something to get people with disabilities out of institutions because of the serious health risks that we're now placing them in, um, in those environments. And so I think HCBS certainly is a big piece of that. The other piece of that is housing assistance, and that is another concern of ours. And I know that um, in these uh, in the third package, and um, I hope um, continuing, there will be um, some focus on amping up housing assistance, whether through the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, through the HOME Program, through the Section 811 Program, and the Emergency Solutions Grant for people who have been in crisis or homeless. And I know that um, uh, I think Senator Casey's office mentioned the uh, 811 program and housing specifically for supportive housing for people with disabilities and um, that is very helpful. I think the amounts that folks were talking about are 
extremely, extremely small. Um, thinking about the number of people that we're talking about around the country, this would serve um, a very, very small number of people. So um, I'm hoping that um, we can do more. And then finally, um, I think it was Julie Hawker who mentioned the, the rationing concerns. This is a very big concern of ours that um, people with disabilities not be denied uh, or given lower priority for life-saving treatment because of their disabilities. And um, we have been involved in filing uh, already two complaints with uh, HHS over the last couple of days, and we'll continue to work with folks around the country where there are rationing schemes that seem to discriminate based on disability. There are certainly ways that People can ration treatment um, that don't discriminate based on disability, but um, it is very concerning and particularly given the long history and backdrop of uh, sort of misguided assumptions, unfounded assumptions about the lives and capabilities of people with disabilities, the quality of life that people have and, um, you know, sort of their ability to um, survive um, given all of the assumptions that we have seen over the years. There is a real well-founded fear that um, unless there is clear guidance and technical assistance for states that we will see a lot of people with disabilities die because um, they can't get the ventilator, they can't get the ICU bed. And in addition, some states seem to have reallocation policies where even if you currently say use a ventilator due to a disability that you could lose your ventilator to somebody else. And so um, those are very real concerns of ours and I will um, pass it on. Jennifer, thank you so much. Let's go back to the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. And there Denise, is. there we go. Thanks, Michael. This is Denise Roselle. I'm the Director of Policy Innovation at AUCD, the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. In case you don't know who we are, um, we're a membership organization that supports and promotes the national network of university-based programs the USED's University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, of which there are 67 across the country, um, the 52 LEND programs, which are training about developmental disability and disability um, for um, early stage professionals, and the IDDRCs, which is the research component. We are one of the DD Act programs that Julie Hawker talked about earlier, along with our partner um, sister organizations the DD councils and the protection and advocacy systems. Um, as Ju Julie so nicely pointed out, we are all at, we are all working. Um, we are all working particularly because our network is engaged on the front lines. Um, we are working with them to try to meet the needs of people with disabilities around the country. Um, the, th the things that we really are focusing on right now, let me make clear that as, as um, the other Julie, um, said earlier from APSI, we agree with all of the things that people are, are and are supporting all of the things that people are talking about on the phone um, today. I think it's really interesting that so many of the disability community has come together on this call and has come together in general supporting a variety of issues, but each of us are taking slightly different pieces. So one of the things, again, because we're on, we are engaged in the frontline work on the ground, that's, you know, our folks are doing clinical care, um, they're working on the transition to telehealth. Um, they're identifying whose basic needs are at risk today, particularly from the DD community, but from the disability community writ large as well. So one of the things we're really focusing on are the groups that are not getting attention in what we are seeing from the federal government right now. So we're trying to focus, um, particularly from Congress, that we're not seeing named in the press and we're not seeing named um, at the top of the list. So for instance, kids who are at risk, the kids are at risk because they have disabilities. We hear a lot about it won't affect children. We hear a lot about it won't, um, you know, kids aren't the biggest risk. Well, that doesn't, that totally ignores kids with disabilities. Um, another one that we're focusing on are people with disabilities who can't get regularly needed supplies. Um, not just the rationing of medical care that Jennifer Mathis was just talking about, which we are also working on and highly concerned about, 
but also the rationing of and shortages of prescription drugs, for instance. Um, where are those, where particularly we're having a run on drugs where somebody mentions this drug might be good or that drug might be good, and, and then there's a run. Um, we're particularly concerned about, those, about the prescription drugs, so we're trying to follow that really closely and feed those needs. Um, again, as Julie Hawker, Mark Schultz, all the folks, Jennifer Sheehy from the federal government have said from the agencies, um, all of us are feeding information up to them about what is, what's being missed, what we're hearing, what you folks are telling us. Um, a second thing that we're working really hard on is um, the, a deep and, and ongoing concern about civil and human rights and potentially those who are not paying attention to those civil and human rights for people with disabilities. So things like ADA, Olmstead, IDEA, voting rights, all of that, as folks on this call, I hope know, continues no matter what happens in the rest of the country, civil rights are civil rights, and those continue. And that doesn't always get as big a, um, an emphasis as we would all hope. And so that's something else that we're working on. We're particularly worried about the risk of institutionalization. Um, again, Jennifer did a really nice job of talking about uh, both the risk of people not being able to get out of whatever institution they're in, but also people who may risk going into an institution when they are currently living in the community, people not able to stay in their homes, either because of something, may, perhaps someone else in the home has now been exposed, maybe there's an issue around that, perhaps there's an issue around, um, there are other issues involved, but what about people who are risk, uh, perhaps folks think they can only get their services if they're in an institution in this in this situation. Well, we all know that's not true. We all know that Olmstead protects that. Um, but that's something else we're, we're really looking at. So there, was a, there was a question in the chat box a minute ago about risk of isolation and what we're doing about that. That's another one that we're really tracking. Um, this clearly means that people cannot get out into the community uh, and what happens there. Um, and lastly, the, um, within this piece is the barriers to work and, and education. Uh, Julie Christensen did a really nice job from AXI talking about work. Education is another one. I know people on this call are probably aware that um, there was an attempt to waive IDEA provisions. Um, that has been fought back, both in large part because of the disability community coming back and saying, no, that's a civil rights law. Um, the new bill, that, at least the language I've seen of this new um, the bill that's out just today, um, still includes a report to um, a report back to Congress by the Secretary of Education about what portions of IDEA or ESSA, um, the Education and Secondary, Edu Elementary and Secondary Education Act um, can be waived. Congress would still have to act on that, but the report is still there. So we are tracking that very closely. And then Denise, finally, th okay. one uh, minute, 10 one minute. Second. No, 10 Plain seconds, language. 10 seconds. Plain language. Um, okay. Finally, the, uh, one of the things that we work really hard on all the time, and I know my colleague Liz Weintraub's on the phone too today, um, is plain language. Um, go to AUCD.org. We have a newsletter that comes out every week. We have alerts up there. We have a new blog post. Um, but the alerts and the, uh, particularly, we work really hard to make sure that's all in plain language so that everything that goes out can be responded to by anyone. And, um, and keep all of the members of the disability community engaged in the work that we're doing. Okay. So thank I would you. absolutely send you there. I'm done, Michael. It's all right, thank you, Denise. Let me go to the Assistive Technology Act programs. We can get that slide up. Great, you thanks can. so much, Michael. Audrey, thank yes. you. Yes, good Try to keep it, we're gonna, we're gonna have to go even shorter. Try to stay to three minutes or less. I can do get that. Get everyone in. Thank I can do you. that. So the Association of Assistive Technology Act programs represents state assistive technology grantees that are in every state and territory charged with serving the birth to death population and the entire state. What the programs are charged with doing um, are, pro are providing access to assistive technology and also the ability to acquire assistive technology. So these are direct services programs who really are at the front lines trying to serve consumers that have a, a, an existing need for assistive technology or a newly found need for assistive technology. And the issues that we've been dealing with and grappling with over the past few weeks is the ability to build a telepresence in order to continue with these direct services because many states 
have been forced to halt um, our device demonstration programs where we allow consumers to interact with assistive technology and then also our loan programs where we have um, assistive technology uh, with consumers so they can test, kind of take it for a test drive and also use it. Um, so what we are looking for and one of our, our issues has been, you know, an, an infusion of funds to help make um, and build a telepresence. Um, also, uh, we need an ability to respond to the due demand for technology at the state level for consumers um, who either, you know, need a device loan or need a longer term loan on a device um, who have developed a need possibly due to the virus um, or just have, you know, an existing um, or a different need that maybe is about combating social isolation. And we need to have the, the need to be able to buy new devices to meet the demand. Um, the demand that we're finding is surging because of the virus and also to circumvent sanitization issues since we usually take used equipment we sanitize it and we ship it back out and you know to a consumer um, every single one of those steps now poses a problem um, in terms of safety and has a safety risk associated with it so um, additionally, since we're moving to a very digital world, um, which, you know, creates ICT accessibility demands across states with their state and local governmental websites and also with local businesses, our programs do have the skills to work to ensure full accessibility of these websites with state entities. Um, we're also working to make sure that our AT programs have the proper sanitization materials in order to sanitize loaned equipment, which has been difficult at this moment. And finally, public awareness is a key piece of our efforts right now. Um, as in many instances, people who are in need and have an acute need for assistive technology, this is the first time that they have found themselves in this position and they may not know even that assistive technology can help solve some of their um, their new challenges. Um, so we are working to respond to all of these items in a way that, um, and one of them is obviously through seeking additional funding through stimulus packages that will be moving forward through Congress. As we do feel assistive technology is, could be a huge help in all of what is happening at the state level um, and help people address some of the new challenges that they are facing. Additionally, okay, we're great. working- let, we Audrey, let me cut you off because we'll never get through all the groups. No problem. All right, thank you. Let me go to the collaboration to promote self-determination, CPSD. Um, Allison, are you there? Yes. Hi, Michael, can you hear me? Yes, and, and try to go to really hone in on three points. Yep. Um, so this is Allison Barkoff from CPSD. I'm also the Director of Advocacy at the Center for Public Representation. Um, CPSD is a coalition of national organizations um, focused on issues around community integration, self-determination, and economic independence for people with disabilities. Um, we are working in coalition with virtually all of the national groups on here and working on many of the same issues, so I will keep it really brief um, and just talk about two or three really quick things. Um, like many of the groups on here, we have been very focused on making sure there are additional funds for community-based services. We are seeing programs closing, um, care workers who are unable to provide services. We were pleased to see that there was some increased Medicaid funding in the Families First bill, but very disappointed that we're seeing out of the Senate at this point, no new funding specifically for home and community-based services, and we're gonna really continue our advocacy on the next package around that. Um, one thing to flag for state advocates is at a state level, states are seeking emergency waivers to, um, to make changes in their Medicaid programs to help address the crisis in their state, ways to increase access to critical services such as quickly bringing on new providers, um, waiving pre-authorizations for services, um, providing services through alternative technology. That's a really important way for state advocates to get involved. Um, we are tracking that on the national level, but um, it's, it's really important for state advocates. Um, I think Maria touched on paid leave for caregivers of adults whose 
uh, with disabilities whose programs are closing or whose care workers are sick. They were not included in uh, COVID-19 bills thus far, and it's something that we are really pushing on. Um, we have been working closely with a number of other legal advocacy organizations, including Bazelon, on the issue of rationing care. Um, and I will just flag, in addition to the complaints that we are filing, we're seeing a lot of state advocates proactively working together and trying to work with their governors and health agencies on affirmatively putting out policies that um, ensure people with disabilities are not discriminated against. And I would really encourage um, state stakeholders to band together and do that work. And then just to piggyback on what Denise Roselle said, we are very concerned about equal access to education, particularly as schools are closed and um, we are looking at distance learning. We're pleased that there is some new funding to uh, state education programs and are very carefully monitoring how students with disabilities are accessing services. And I will stop there and turn it back Thank over you. to you. Thank you, Allison. Let me go next to the uh, CSAVR, the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation. And Rita, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'll try to be brief. So we are in the process. We have been reaching out to individual state agencies, asking them to share with us any challenges uh, that they're experiencing in their efforts to deliver services, either uh, virtually or remotely. Uh, our goal is to um, collect and comprise this information, looking for commonalities of might require a waiver or a modification of policy within the uh, act or the regulations and the department. Just, you know, when you're responsible for delivering individualized services, it, it, folks are just facing significant challenges in trying to figure out how to do that in a remote or a virtual environment. So uh, we're wielding questions from the individual states. Uh, our ultimate goal is to uh, compile a list of the things where folks are experiencing the most challenges and then forwarding in a letter to the department uh, asking for some flexibilities and some relief uh, as they are attempting to provide as many services as possible in creative and innovative ways just because of the uh, challenges. I will say a significant number of agencies are also reaching out to community rehabilitation programs and other providers of VR services, just trying to gain information on what services they think they could deliver or would be able to deliver, you know, in a virtual or remote environment. So information gathering at this point, but with the ultimate goal of asking for some relief through flexibility and policy and some waivers. Um, is what we're working on. Rita, thank you so much. Let's go to the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. And uh, Robin, are you there? Uh, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yes, my name is Robin Troutman. I'm the Deputy Director at the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. Um, and we represent the 56 state and territory councils um, that are throughout the country that are federally mandated. Um, just some quick updates, because I know we're trying to get through all the group. Um, state councils have been moving quickly, uh, assisting governors and state health agencies in responding to the COVID-19 crisis uh, by identifying and filling gaps in state emergency response and by collaborating um, with governors and state agencies on Medicaid emergency waivers. NACDD is helping by being a resource for state DD councils to help share effective tools and strategies for their work uh, to help advocate for state COVID-19 response policy that meets the needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, some example, just two quick examples on the emergency uh, response efforts. Um, one is Cal the California State Council along with um, Green Mountain Self Advocates from Vermont and the Vermont um, uh, DD Council. They have worked to create a plain language resource guide in both English and Spanish, um, which includes information about how the COVID uh, response affects jobs, day programs, 
uh, supplemental security income checks and uh, as well as links to additional information. You can find this uh, really awesome guide um, on most council web pages by now, definitely the NACDD uh, web page um, and of course Green Mountain Self Advocates. Um, we also um, uh, it's throughout social media as well, uh, the both English and Spanish versions. Um, another example in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Board for People with Developmental Disabilities has uh, leveraged their relationship with the governor, Governor Evers, to raise the concerns of the uh, Survival Coalition, which is a state-based disability coalition about the critical role of direct service professionals to meet the needs of people with disabilities during the COVID crisis. And then through their efforts, they successfully advocated for the governor to designate the workforce that provides in-home support and services to people with disabilities and older adult, adults as essential personnel um, and ser services, which is a critical designation that I know uh, Commissioner Hawker mentioned, as well as uh, Maria Town mentioned. Um, so uh, Wisconsin is a great example of how they're getting um, that uh, moving forward. Um, I know some people talked about Medicaid emergency waivers. Uh, some state councils are working with their state departments of health and other state agencies to promote um, 1135 waivers to slow the spread of COVID-19 and the, these waivers can help support direct service providers and professionals so they can continue to provide critical services to people. Um, NACDD is just working with um, all of their councils to uh, and the public policy committee as well as most of the groups on this call uh, to promote um, and share effective tools and strategies for advocating at the state level. Um, I know we are working very closely currently with the Maryland Council um, on um, getting uh, their close relationship with Governor Hogan to uh, make sure that he's putting language in about the the needs of people with disabilities in the state of Maryland and I am most recently the the governor of Illinois uh, through the work of the council, um, a lot of their advocacy efforts um, as well as their collaboration efforts um, ensured that the governor's uh, remarks um, and emergency plans, it did include people with disabilities. Um, uh, in conclusion, just, um, you know, state councils continue to be a trusted resource for governors and state agencies as they respond to meet the needs of people with developmental disabilities in their states. Um, and we're so thankful to all the groups on this call um, for working with us and us working with you. Um, so for continued collaboration, so that way we can all uh, do our part, please. Um, reach out to me, uh, my email, I'll put it in the chat box, um, but and nacdd.org. Okay, thank you, Robin. Let me turn next to National Disability Rights Network. And uh, Cheryl, are you there? Cheryl? Okay, not right now. Let's go to, <laughs> oh yes, you are there. I hear you. I am here. Sorry. Oh, good. Go um, ahead. I'm with the National Disability Rights Network, and we are the federally mandated and federally funded protection and advocacy agency that exists in, in all of the 57 states and territories, including the Native American Consortium down in the southwest corner of the United States. We provide legal-based advocacy to individuals with disabilities um, so that we can protect their human, civil, and, and um, human and civil rights and protect them from abuse, neglect, or discrimination based on disability. These are extremely troubling times right now, and we have literally responded to every issue I think that's already been identified. We have people in residential and detention facilities. We are concerned about medical um, treatment, evictions, housing, all kinds of things. And so what I will do is say that we are available to help people with disabilities um, with the issues that um, are confronting them. We have an organization in every state and territory, and so you can find that information on our webpage, which I will post in the chat box. And we, like everybody else, is working really hard and working with other organizations to protect people with disabilities, make sure that they're not um, unnecessarily institutionalized, denied medical treatment, um, laid off, or whatever because of their disability. So, Michael, I'll turn it back to you. Fantastic. National Down Syndrome Congress. 
Uh, is Heather or David with us? Yes. Hi, Michael. This is Heather. Hi, Heather. Hi, I'm the policy director for the National Down Syndrome Congress. Um, NDSC is the country's oldest and largest national organization for people with Down syndrome, their families, and the professionals who serve them. Um, we provide information, advocacy, and support um, you know, concerning all aspects of life for individuals with Down syndrome. And we also have a very large nationwide grassroots program, the National Down Syndrome Syndrome Advocacy Coalition, and our folks have been out in full force trying to get some of the disability priorities into the COVID packages, like those advocates of so many other organizations on the call. Um, what we're hearing is um, social isolation is, you know, a huge problem for people with Down syndrome. They're being stuck at home, away from their jobs or day programs. Um, so obviously, we're, you know, advocating for increased uh, funding for HCBS um, and for direct support professionals. Uh, we have a very active self-advocate council um, and they have been having online meetings which seems to help a little bit um, but we're investigating other ways to provide virtual learning and social opportunities. We're also engaged in healthcare, and we're very lucky that the president of our board of directors um, runs the Down Syndrome Clinic at Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. His name is Dr. Kishore Velody um, and so he's been doing podcasts along with an inf infectious disease specialist about COVID. Um, those podcasts are available on our website. Um, and then we've also been focusing a lot on education, um, recognizing that, you know, need for flexibility and innovation, but needing to make sure that students' rights are protected under IDEA, ESSA, and the Higher Education Act. Um, to that end, we've been developing some free webinars. We're two-thirds of the way through a three-part series with Dr. Sean Smith from the University of Kansas on preparing your home, family, and student for online learning. You can access those webinars and all of our past webinars for free at ndsccenter.org. And I just want to thank everyone for all of their work and um, I'll send it back to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Heather. Let's go to the National Organization on Disability. Uh, is, Charles, are you there? Charles, let's keep moving then. Let's go to um, next, uh, Paralyzed Veterans. And Heather, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, so Paralyzed Veterans of America is a congressionally chartered veteran service organization. All of our members are veterans of the armed forces um, and have spinal cord injuries or disorders such as MS or ALS. Um, we have the opportunity to serve um, a, a variety of veterans who have those disabilities, but also watch the broader veteran community um, and broader disability communities as well. So just wanted to quickly note, because we haven't, uh, people don't know a lot about the veterans community necessarily, that we have 19.2 million veterans um, and about 5 million of those receive uh, disability compensation from the VA each month. So that means they get a check each month um, from the VA uh, because they have a disability that's related to their military service. Um, and of the 19.2 million veterans, um, about half of those are age 65 or older. So the veteran population is definitely um, at, at high risk for, uh, for COVID-19. Um, and although the VA is, is a wonderful system, it's important to remember that not all veterans are eligible for VA care. Um, PVA's members, thankfully, um, do have access to the VA. Uh, the three actions that we're watching, one are just monitoring the VA's healthcare system, the specialized care that they provide um, is not available um, in the same manner uh, in the civilian sector, the, the private, uh, uh, public, the private uh, medical uh, sector. So we want to make sure that those specialized services uh, continue to move forward. We're also closely watching the impact of VA's fourth mission, which is that is to backstop the broader private healthcare system and what impact that will have on the veterans um, that they already serve. Uh, it's already been mentioned, um, we're seeing the same impacts on uh, access to home care, personal care attendance. Um, VA has home care programs, uh, but many times uh, they are contracting with community service providers, 
um, veterans receive as part of their compensation uh, money that they use to hire their own personal care attendants. So we're seeing the same issues there with uh, potential shortages, concerns about personal protective equipment, the gloves, masks, things that people need to, to keep them safe. Uh, also concerned about potential rationing of care and have been, been watching those efforts. Um, and then also looking at uh, access to VA benefits. Uh, because VA is, is more than a healthcare system. As I said, they also provide disability compensation, which is a monthly benefit, kind of like Social Security, um, that is, is very um, important to the individual to receive that. Uh, so we're making sure that all the various parts of VA that work together are able to continue to serve our veterans um, and also watching as VA is being uh, mobilized to serve the broader community. PVA has our uh, a place on our website, pva.org uh, backslash COVID-19, uh, where we are putting information about uh, veterans issues and, and specific to our population. Uh, so if you have veterans that you're serving, um, certainly uh, have them feel free to reach out to our organization or any of the other uh, veterans service organizations um, that they can provide assistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Let's go to United Spinal Association. And uh, Steve or Kent, are you there? Uh, this is Steve. Uh, I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy for uh, United Spinal Association. Thank you, Michael, for organizing this. NDI, thank you. Um, thank you for everybody for, uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'll try and be brief in the interest of time. Um, a lot of folks on the call have already highlighted uh, some of the issues that we're very much focused on. First, let me uh, step back for a second. United Spinal Association, if, we're, if uh, you're not familiar with us, uh, we are the uh, largest uh, nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for all people living with spinal cord injuries and disorders. It's about 2 million people in this country uh, that we serve. Um, we're also a uh, VA accredited uh, veteran service organization serving veterans with disabilities of all kinds. Um, so some of the challenges that we're seeing, um, you know, we've obviously been very focused on uh, the need for additional funding for uh, Medicaid HCBS. Um, that was a problem before this crisis, uh, but it is even more of a problem now. Um, we are hearing from our members um, that uh, they are experiencing uh, caregiver shortages. Um, this is a big issue for our members. We've had uh, folks uh, that have uh, written in to us telling us that they have gone days without uh, having a caregiver that they, uh, that they need um, that is severely negatively impacting their lives. Um, we are also hearing uh, from our members um, uh, loudly and uh, increasingly more terrified about the uh, possibility of shortages of uh, needed goods, needed supplies uh, from uh, medications uh, and durable medical equipment to uh, items such as catheters uh, and surgical gloves. Um, this is something that uh, increasingly we are hearing uh, from our members that they are very, very scared that they're not going to be able to get some of these items that they need uh, for their daily lives. And we've been very much engaged on some of these other issues that folks have been uh, talking about, um, issues such as uh, the medical rationing issue and uh, other issues. Uh, but I want to pass the microphone figuratively over to Kent one, my, uh, one minute. One minute, Kent. Let's go. One ahead. minute. Okay. Well, let me thank uh, Senator Casey on behalf of all of us and his colleagues for their support. Uh, and to bring home the point Steve just made, I'm a high level quadriplegic who uses a power chair if I've got a PCA to help me transfer into it. But my PCAs work with other individuals, so my isolation is necessarily limited. PCAs were already difficult for all of us to find. And if one of my PCAs myself isolate, It'll be hard pressed for me to get out of bed, even to get work done at home. I have no family locally. I have a, a new wheelchair pending delivery and a former one to donate that could be helping somebody else. Both those DME deliveries are now on hold. And finally, exam gloves, which are a basic necessity for my PCAs, two weeks ago cost 30 some dollars a case. Now those are out of stock and I'm looking at paying 90 to $100 a case, but who knows how long that supply will last. Thank you, Michael. 
And thank you for bringing it home to a personal experience. Let's go quickly to World Institute on Disability. Marcy, take it away. Okay, hi everybody. This is Marcy Roth from WID. The World Institute on Disability was established in 1983 as one of the first global disability rights organizations founded and continually led by people with disabilities. WID works to advance the rights and opportunities of over 1 billion people with disabilities worldwide. Uh, today I am addressing two things. One, the obligation of government and recipients and sub-recipients of federal financial assistance in disasters and public health emergencies. And two, maintaining a focus on readiness for concurrent disasters. The ADA, Rehab Act, and other disability civil rights laws are never waverable. There are no loopholes or exceptions in emergencies and disasters. Any recipient or sub-recipient of federal funds is required to make their programs accessible to individuals with disabilities. Its protections apply to all programs and businesses that receive any federal funds. This includes the obligation to serve individuals with disabilities in the most integrated setting appropriate to, to their needs with continuity of the services and supports they need to maintain their health, safety, dignity, and independence. If that was in the community the day before the public health emergency was declared, only new acute medical conditions needing hospital or nursing home care would qualify for removal from the community. After the HHS secretary declared a national public health emergency, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid followed by issuing 1135 waivers two weeks ago, uh, allowing for a number of flexibilities. Many of these are helpful. However, the 1135 waivers have been repeatedly offered to states since at least Hurricane Harvey to move people with disabilities into long-term care facilities. Despite the CMS language in the 1135 waivers, these waivers do not supersede the prohibition on waivers that violate the civil rights of people with disabilities as described by DOJ as far back as 2007. Unfortunately, there are now 13 states who uh, have been told that they can waive this incorrectly. Uh, with regard to uh, concurrent disasters, WID is committed to our work alongside a coalition of disability organizations and allies led by the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies. We have been continually pushing for passage of the Real Emergency Access for Aging and Disability Inclusion for Disasters Act and the Disaster Medicaid Relief Act. We are extremely concerned that none of the language from these bills was included in the stimulus package number three. We must not continue to overlook the very real potential for a concurrent hurricane, wildfire, tornado, earthquake, flood, or other disaster. These bipartisan, bicameral bills led by Senator Casey could have been dropped right into the pending stimulus package. They are chock full of tools for improving accessibility and protecting civil rights before, during, and after disasters. Who is going to monitor and enforce the civil rights obligations of the federal government and their recipients and sub-recipients that come with each of the $2 trillion about to be distributed? Who's gonna provide technical assistance that is so badly needed? Without any explicit mention or additional resources, it looks like it will be business as usual at FEMA and HHS, just as in each of the many recent emergencies and disasters. Ready has specific language to address monitoring and enforcement of the rights of people with disabilities and communities in disasters and public health emergencies. Why in the world is this not a priority? The partnership, WID, and the Nickel Emergency Planning Subcommittee put out a COVID-19 call to action three weeks ago. Maintaining a focus on monitoring and enforcing civil rights can protect a lot of people. Please don't ignore this very real need. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, and thank you to all our panelists. If we can quickly and just uh, go over by a few minutes, I uh, want to share with you um, takeaways from the first listening session, which were amplified clearly by what we heard today, and we will modify this list. The first is around access to community-based services is threatened. Number two, next slide, please. 
Loss of jobs and income puts people with disabilities at greater risk than ever before. Not only people with disabilities, family members impacted, and we heard over and over again about the challenges to direct care, direct support professionals. Number three, loss of access to existing healthcare services. And we heard over and over again, fear of priority setting for testing, medical equipment and treatment that consider people with disabilities less valued and go to the back of the line. Students at risk of not being able to access uh, special education and general education services. Students with disabilities should not be discriminated against in the move to distance learning. And five, we must closely monitor together, as we heard across organization, policy developments and practices at a state and community level against changes in access to healthcare and other absolutely needed community-based support services. And finally, civil rights laws, go back one slide, please. Civil rights laws protecting against discrimination, as Marcy so eloquently stated and others, cannot be waived in emergency situations. Number six, next slide. Federal agencies should offer flexibility in their rules and regs to increase funding for needed supports and services that were not adequate before, but are even less adequate today. And number seven, the disability community must work together closely with healthcare systems, emergency responders, public agencies, and others to be more vigilant and not ignore the urgent needs of people across the spectrum of disabilities and families most adversely impacted by this virus crisis. Collaboration, as Marcy just shared, is not just at this point in time, but must be in place in the future in terms of contingency planning to consider future emergency situations. And finally, number eight, what is clear today and yesterday is over 1,500 people joined these lines and joined listening to this conversation. The power of unity of purpose is evident. The diversity of the disability community has not kept us from being unified today by a common purpose to be heard and a public response that must be developed to meet the emergency needs of people with disabilities and families. Uh, as we move from funding and legislation, there hopefully will be a part four, but as we move to the state and local level, the collective voice must focus continuing on educating decision makers, not only in what was omitted from these packages, but in the uh, clear equity in the uh, support received by the funding that's now going to flow across the country, across public and private sector. We will add to this list uh, based on things that were said today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is listed for you and links to many other pieces of information. The Families First, which was the first congressional response uh, frequently asked questions from CMS uh, for state Medicaid and children's health insurance programs. Next slide, please. Uh, there is a great Southeast ADA resource page, and there are many other organizations who talk today about, please, whether you're a member or not, visit their organization pages for other resources. Uh, you saw many other resources listed in the chat page. Jennifer shared with us, and you can go to USDOL, www.dol.gov slash coronavirus. There is a new resource NDI has put together on promoting financial health and resiliency for people with disabilities and their families during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, and there are some APSI resources as well. Next slide. Um, there is an important joint statement that has been issued by banks, regulatory agencies, encouraging them to waive late fees, to waive overdraft fees, to waive penalty fees for early withdrawal on time deposits, and other things they could do to ease access to credit for people and organizations in the disability community and other communities who are so uh, much impacted by financially uh, by the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis today.
Next slide, please. Um, so where do we go? Take the survey. Your organization, as well as through uh, below, there uh, is a, a set of questions in addition to the pop-up poll questions during today. Please share the survey, have people um, fill it out. We'll take responses for about a week. Uh, we already have over 500 responses from people uh, on yesterday and today's um, uh, listening session and we hope to have over a thousand. As you heard over and over again, echoed by the groups talking today, do not forget your voice counts. Talk with members of Congress, talk with decision makers at a state and local level to make sure that people with disabilities and their families and service provider agencies are not left out of emergency economic stimulus legislation, appropriations, and now implementation. Listening sessions will uh, today and yesterday will be archived on the NDI website. Next slide, please. So thank you today for this collaborative effort. I've learned a lot, some new things since added from yesterday. Thank you to uh, Senator Casey. Thank you to our federal leaders. Thank you to all of you and all the organizations participating. Our work is just beginning. This virus is not near its end. Uh, we must continue to find ways to work together. All the information we continue to learn from you as we listen to you, we will make available on our National Disability Institute website, as well as through the participating organizations. Thank you, stay safe, stay collaborative, uh, and uh, communicate with us about your needs. Have a wonderful afternoon. Let's stay safe and working together. Thank you.